Hi guys, welcome to our 2K Q and A. Um, it's a small landmark, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand subscribers. Yeah, it's I mean, exciting. Yeah, I mean, in YouTube land, it's a small thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. But we're excited and was really grateful, guys, for you guys watching and especially the comments. The comments have been so good. Yeah, yeah. Very whole, positive. Yeah, very positive. Um, we learn a load from them as well. Yeah. And for you guys, it's a really safe place to comment and talk to each other because we don't allow any uh, swearing, abuse, anything like that. Yeah. So it's a really nice place to go and comment. So we're going to, well, the sensible thing, Al, I guess, would have been to pick some of the best ones and answer yep. them in detail. Yeah, yeah, good idea. So we're not going to do that. Nope. Uh, no, we're going to try and answer as many as we can, as quickly as we can. Al's going to chip in where he thinks of I need questioning. Yep. Um, but let's just go for it. Here we go. Cool. Uh, right, so first one, Eugene yes. Poon. Um, Danny Cipriani, where does he belong? Does he deserve an England place? 10-12 oh. axis for Farrell, potentially. <laughs> What a great question, Eugene. Um, yeah, he probably does, but it's really late in the day, isn't it? Yeah. So late in the day, and he might be leaving the Premiership. This is also true. If he's not leaving the Premiership, I would say, let's take him on the summer tour. We'll probably leave Farrell behind, maybe even Ford mm. behind, and I'd play him as a number one at 10. Okay. And maybe bring uh, Marcus Smith on as kind of his understudy. So put the pressure on nice. Cipriani, say, what have you got? You're the number one, go for it. Yeah. As a 10-12, yeah, I could possibly see him playing the 10 role with a Farrell outside, but again, it's very late in the day. He's um, also slightly defensively worse off than George Ford, I think. They tend to hide him a bit of wasps, don't yeah. they? So. Yeah, I mean, he's bigger, but Ford's got a better technique, but both yeah. could, again, be a bit of, yeah. a, bit of a problem. Anyway, anyway, I think I'd, I'd just chip in with that. I think he's somebody who does create something out of nothing. He's one of those flair players that you want to have in and around the squad. Mm. Whether he's consistent enough to take it forwards going forwards yeah. well if he doesn't unsure. if he doesn't come this summer then it's definitely all up yeah there. but this there's is, no question that he's a world-class fly half just well, been a bit just yes but we haven't with opportunities. we haven't seen it on the global no state. that is true oh, that's our first question now yeah, yeah sorry minute, so. right Connor Furlong uh do you think success inevitably leads to staleness oh. as happened to Ireland post 2015 uh and England post 2017 perhaps because coaches are too afraid to change the way their teams play when they've had big success. Wow, what a great question. I, you know, I like his brother, his brother's a great player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ty Furlong. Yeah. Um, but Connor's asked a great question there. Um, hard to maintain success. Why is it hard to maintain success? Because unless you're significantly better than the opposition, yeah. it has to be based on effort and organisation and those sorts of things. Yeah. That, um, you know, New Zealand have been top of the tree because they have fantastic effort and organisation, but they are significantly better players than everyone else. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with something like England, they're not significantly better individually than everyone else. So when they drop off slightly, yeah. um, psychologically, fitness, whatever it is, then you can see quite a, a dramatic fall in performance. That's, <laughs> that's my answer to that. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, right, well, next one, Chris H. Yeah. Uh, England, how about two Alangis ball carrying, lip smacking, line breaking, cool fizzing, brackets, ever injured alternative for Tio? Yeah. Uh, I know Al is against the idea, true, for the ever injured reason, but still he's one hell of a player and previously discussed. It seems like, uh, it seems that the injured Rugby World Cup squad players can be replaced. So, what are your <laughs> thoughts, Rich? Chris H, um, thank you, Chris. You've put loads of great comments in over the years. Yeah. So, you deserve this one to be read out. Ironically, Tuolang has just been injured <laughs> yesterday, I think. Yeah. You know, a pec injury, yes, it's a different injury, but he has had another pec issue. His knee's still he heavily strapped. So yeah. I was going to say something a bit different, but actually I think Al's probably right. I just don't think we can build anything on him. Yeah. Because he's just, you know, hasn't proven to be durable enough. I mean, then, and there's no question that a fully, flip, a fully fit Tuolang yeah. Would start at twelve for England. There's no or thirteen. There's no question about it. But okay, I don't think he'll string enough game time together, which yeah. is my ever injured issue. Yeah, he won't get the game time needed. And we've seen from To the Six Nations that the lack of game time has meant he's been really off the pace, and he's looked a shell yeah. of what he was before the Lions tour. Yeah, I, I think Tua Lang is just you know a, 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 I hope is a hope. Yeah, and until yeah, yeah, then, yeah. I don't think we can say anything. Really. No, exactly. Next, uh, Ross Barron. Are Ireland capable of winning the World Cup based on their current status? Okay. Yes, of course they are. The word is capable. He gave me an easier question. Yeah, that's if true. He said, "Will Ireland win?" Then I mean that is incredibly hard to say. Yeah. Of course they're 
capable. New Zealand are probably going to be, you know, have the best odds okay. of capability to win the World Cup, but Ireland are going to be right up there, you know, along with a lot of other teams who are capable of winning it. Mm. And, you know, that's the right question. I think the extended question is what are the odds that they will win it? Yeah. And, you know, out of the Northern Hemisphere teams, they've probably got the best odds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, right. Will uh, Ken Mir. Oh, it's a long one. This is a long one. Uh, hi guys, love the videos, keep up the good work, good thanks very much. Uh, as an England fan, it seems the other countries, Wales and Ireland especially, seem to have a great depth at six and seven. Ireland, Levy, Van der Fleer, Amani, O'Brien and Wales, Navidi, Shingler, Walt and Tipperick. Um, Moriarty, you could add to that list as well. Uh, whereas England, barring, Robin, uh, barring Rob Shaw, seem to be lacking real depth and quality at flanker. What do you think England struggle in this position in comparison to the other rivals? Uh, and who do you see as being the possible solution to England's issues at flanker? Undersill Simmons, the Currys, etc. Right, okay, big question. Why do they struggle? Well, yep. I can't put my finger on anything systemic in the way that England play, in the way the Premiership plays particularly. I, I think it really is just a natural blip where there just aren't that many flankers around at the moment in their mid to late 20s, 30s who are mature. Yeah. You know, and I see plenty of good flankers coming up through the system, so clearly, you know, there's nothing that wrong with it. No, no. And the guys he's mentioned, you know, Underhill, Curry, I think Ben Earl's got a great chance, I think Jack Willis has got a great chance. Yeah. These are players that could be great flankers, we just don't have them at the right age at the moment. Yeah. So I'm calling it a bit of a blip. Okay. Um, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, for, from my point of view of this one, it's an interesting dilemma. I think that there are lots of guys around, but I, I know from reading a lot about Eddie Jones that he likes to see his players, ha they are the best in the world at something. Yeah. So yeah. you've got Warburton, who may be the best in the world at getting over the ball getting quickly. Ball, yeah. um, Moriarty might be the best ball carrying six in the world. Okay. That's something he likes to see. They've got a little X factor. Yeah. So it just might be that these young guys haven't developed that X factor slot yet. And as soon yeah. as they do, you look with Zach Mercer, who's gone from an apprentice yeah. to a... Well, all forwards only really develop to their best in their mid to late 20s yeah. Yeah. because of strength, essentially. Yeah, exactly. You know, physicality. So I, I think the future is there. It's just there's nothing there at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> give it time. Uh, cool. Right, Ben Huxtable-Smith and Guy Zinzan. Uh, should England Lions and some seniors players be left at home for the summer tour? Okay. My addition, oh. yeah, if yes, who? Oh, that, that, give us some specific question. names. My answer was yes, lots. That's true. I'll make it more difficult. No. Give, me, give me a couple of names. Okay. Um, well, obviously, uh, players like Farrell should be left. Nothing to prove. The players that be left should be left at home. The guys who have played a lot and have got nothing to prove. I'm sure they want to play and they're probably physically capable of playing. Yeah. But what's the point? So, guys like... Uh, Farrell, you know, a Toe Jay, um, who Come else? On the spot here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rob Shaw, I <laughs> okay. think, has played enough rugby. Yeah. Um, you know, Mike Brown, I don't think, needs to prove anything. Yeah. Uh, Daly, I don't think, needs to prove anything. So players like this, I'll definitely. Think okay. Know. Brilliant. Um, right, Catherine and Paul Futers. Uh, who do you think is the most improved team in the Six Nations over the last year? France. Next. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, Patrick Corbett, any chance of foul being dropped, lost his nerve kicking and offers little else, discipline a big issue as well. Mm, I wouldn't say he was that bad Patrick, but um, I think the answer would be, be no, he's too important to England, um, even if he plays a bit below par, I think they don't have anyone else like him, I think yeah. he's far too important, especially in the leadership as well. Yeah, I think you, the, the same flip thing goes for Johnny Sexton with Ireland, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. His kicking was off. He didn't look... He, he was good, mm. but I think he's been better. Um, and again, yeah. you wouldn't drop Johnny Sexton, no. so Farrell's in the same no, I think Sexton was carrying a few injuries with his kicking there, but you still wouldn't drop him. No, because no, of that, no. no way. Okay, uh, Bruce Thorpe. Why is home advantage such a big biggie in the Six Nations? Research in football showed when crowds are banned, there was no home advantage. Analysis in other sports indicates referee rulings in the last quarter of close games did favour home teams. T uh, should not TMO and assistance make a change? It's interesting that home advantage. It's a very good question. Yeah, it, very good question. It's not something anyone really exactly knows what it is. Yeah. But it's definitely there. Mm. I I'll chuck a couple of other factors in there. Think even if you've played at amateur level, whatever level, you know, playing at home just makes you feel better. Yeah. Things like less travel. Okay, that's a huge thing. Mm. Not having to travel. It's just brilliant. You can get up when you want, you can do your routine, you're not stressed about when you get there. Yeah. That's a biggie. Even teams that travel up the day before or whatever, they still have to travel. Yeah. It still takes a day out of their you know, um, 
week. Familiarity with the surroundings, that's quite big. Less distractions, less things to take your mind away from the job in hand. Yeah. So all these things added up, even without the crowd and even without the TMO, do make differences. Yeah. That's my answer there. Good answer. Uh, right, Fraser Posford. Uh, how do England sort out their problems in the back row and centres? Is it a case of bringing new personnel or having players back from injury? Or do they need to change something tactically about the way they're playing? Poor. I think go back to the answer I gave before. That there are sevens there, but they're young. And I would play them. I, wouldn't, I would stop probably going with a makeshift seven. Yeah. Moving Robshaw across, moving Haskell across, whatever it is. I'd stick with one of those young guys. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think at six and eight, actually, there, there are good players there that you can build a team on. Robshaw, I think armand has got a big future for England. I, yeah, I yeah. see him s- such a perfect player for that England team. Yeah. In the six, covering eight role, definitely. Um, Billy, obviously, there. I think Brad Shields is going to be a, a really useful player coming over. Yeah. Um, so I think that's fine. I'd play those guys six and eight and then just keep playing the youngsters at seven. Yeah. Even if it means you drop a few games or whatever. Yeah. I think that's the way to go. Okay, cool. What about centres? I was trying to avoid them. Oh, um, really? okay. <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Uh, I think Daly definitely would fit into 13. Um, the Ford Farrell combo is probably the best at the moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just because there isn't any viable alternative, it is a bit of a vulnerability. It's not perfect, mm. but I think maybe you just have to suck it up and say, okay, Ford and Farrell is the combo with a JJ or a Daily. Okay. Um, and that's just the best at the moment that we have. Okay, cool. Uh, right, Bert Chesterfield Livingston Jr. Also, can England get past using Billy to break the game line every time? This is a very good, this is a good question. Yeah. Feels like they've become too reliant on him. Okay, great name by the way, Bert Chesterfield Livingston yeah. Jr. Um, Billy's a world class eight, okay, and, and England don't have any other player like him, okay, no. not many people do. So you kind of have to build a game around him when he's playing because he's that good. Yeah. So when you miss him, you can't really replace him and play the same way. Mm. You have to kind of adapt and change, change your way of playing. And I think that's just how it is, unfortunately. Yeah. When he's there, you build the team around him. You play around him because he's that good. When he's not there, you just have to change. Yeah, I think it's the, the big thing for me is when Nathan Hughes has been, has, hasn't been fully fit. They've had a, a relatively like-for-like replacement. Not mm-hmm. in the same league, really, but a big ball-carrying eight yeah. who's come in and done a, done a job. He's not been fully fit, and no. they've really struggled with that impact. They play the same way, and it doesn't work with yep. Sam Simmons, who's not as physically strong. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it's a good, yeah, good point. Uh, right, and again, Bert Chesterfield, Livingston oh, Jr. Oh, give him two questions? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Who is England's to. best seven? <laughs> okay, um, at the moment, limited exposure, but I think Underhill's the best seven. I think you've just got to stick with him yeah. or one of the other youngsters. I yeah. think that's the way to go. Okay. Uh, Guy Zinzan, whose oh, stock do you think has fallen the most in this set Six Nations? Uh, Tia. Okay, why? Uh, it just hasn't performed to where I thought he would. I thought he was so good on the Lions. I yep. generally got excited that this guy could be top draw. Yeah. I haven't seen anything of it. Maybe no. it's fitness, game time, I don't know. Okay. Harris Rear, question on Wales here, lads. Uh, who would you pick in a key game in a Welsh back row? More so six and seven, excuse me. Uh, as Falatau was surely shooing at eight. I, yeah, I think that's a fair point. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, outside halves. Let's do the first one first. So okay. let's do six and seven first. Yeah. Who would you go for? I'd go for, I think Shingler's close, but I'd still go Moriarty Warburton. Okay, agreed. Okay. Um, <laughs> again, you feel a bit sorry for Tipperick, missing out again. Yeah. Um, right, outside half. Bigger <laughs> Anscom Patchell or maybe someone else? Okay. We don't really know. There's not a lot of evidence out there. With the evidence we have, I would still say bigger. Yeah. Okay. Even though the game plan may well suit an Anscum or mm. a Patch or a Priestland better, we just haven't seen them enough to say. Yeah. So I'd have to say bigger for now. Okay. Uh, Adrian Patterson, England have destroyed, have been destroyed at the breakdown against Scotland, France, and Ireland. So why would you have Rob Shaw over the outstanding Peter O'Mahony? Yeah, I probably wouldn't. Probably. Yeah, Peter O'Mahony. Probably say that. I think, I, I, for me, I'd have Rob Shaw because he's played exceptionally well in a poor team. Okay. Against, and he one. stood out against Ireland, France and, uh, and Wales, uh, and Scotland as well, actually. So, yeah. that, for me, that's why. He yeah. stood out in a poor team. Omani, world-class player, not yeah. disputing that. But I think for work rate alone, I think okay. I would personally have Rob Shaw Yeah, I'd probably go 
Omani, but that's all personal preference. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Blaze Mullow, uh, which players could Eddie Jones add to his 23 by Six Nations 2019? Manu Tuolangi, possibly Manu, depending. Oh, that's, that's you. my Sorry. Yes. I've actually made some notes on this. Sorry. Let's say that question. Let's say that question. Let's see what you want. It's like, uh, like Anchorman. Yeah. Right? Blaze Mullow. You can read anything that's on the other queue. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Blaze Mullow, which players could Eddie Jones add to his 23 by Six Nations 2019? Manu Tuolangi. Oh, good question mark at the question end there. Yeah. Um, well, we talked about Tuolangi yeah. and his injury problems, so we'll leave that one out okay. there. I think, guys, I would see in the 23, which is like your match day 23, yep. I could see Armand in there, yep. I could see Brad Shields in there, I could see Slade in there, and I could see Marcus Smith in there. Okay. Not all staffing, but in the 23. Okay. Uh, right, Finley Gunn. Who would you pick for a 40-man squad if the Lions tour was this year after the insurgence stroke dropping of players? Uh, I can't pick all 40, no way, that's far too hard. <laughs> what I would say, if anyone wants to pick 40, go for it in the yeah. comments, that's cool. What I would say is, picking a Lions squad is different to picking a team of the tournament. Mm. I think there's players that haven't even played in the Lions, uh, sorry, haven't even played in this year's Six Nations that you would pick for a Lions. Yeah. And maybe even to start. Yeah. Players like you know Warburton would would be there, probably starting. Jonathan Davis. Jonathan Davis, okay. So I think it's very different picking the Lions than it is using the Six Nations yeah. to solely pick. Okay. Okay. Uh, right, Corny165, are England's failings or tangible issues? Breakdown midfield selection, tiredness, or are the performances symptomatic of discord behind the scenes? My opinion, uh, I'm toying with the idea players aren't really buying into Jones's message anymore. His tantrum saying he wasn't going to pick certain players in the future only gave that traction. I, I would find it very hard to believe that players aren't buying into him. Yeah. Because the success he's brought, you know, there's no reason not to buy into his messages. And they've been correct so far. Yeah. I think they just haven't, A, been able to implement those messages physically. Yeah. And also, actually, I think, yes, that some of those messages weren't a bit, were a bit off point. Certainly mm. around the breakdown, how they organised the pods in the forwards with talked about that in previous um, um, videos so yeah. maybe in the future maybe then his message might start waning a bit but I don't think in this Six Nations I could say that no okay uh, right Philip Stewart uh, is this Six Nations proof that the Pro 14 is certainly is currently a better league than its more uh, money heavy European counterpart Ooh, uh, it de depends on your definition of better yeah okay there's it's definite that the Pro 14 is better at making sure their players, high quality players, do not play overplay. They do not overplay and yep. they're fresh with the internationals. So if that's your definition of you know better, then mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Okay. For actual quality, I think it is very similar. Yeah. I don't know, the proof of being who gets in the final and who wins it, I think, at the, at the end of it. I know there are a lot of Pro 14 teams yep. still left in. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be a really interesting kind of end of the season battle for that yep. Champions Cup. Definitely. Uh, right, Miffy Creatures, uh, Johnny May or Elliot Daly, short and sweet? Daly. Okay, why? Uh, okay, because it's more versatile, um, more important, offers a lot more, you know, slightly better rugby brain, you know, if you had the choice of the two, you'd probably go for him, although I think May's a very good player. Okay, uh, right, Finley Scott, what are your opinions on how England play in attack and do they need to change their attacking setup? Yeah, I mean, some changes are needed, but you know, actually watching back the last 50, it's grasping at straws here, when you watch mm. back the last 15 minutes against Ireland, they attacked really well, um, you know, they got over the gain line, they played really quick, there was some good interplay, they were yeah. moving the ball into space, that's how they want to play. Um, it's just a question of, are their forwards set up to create that quick ball, you know, in the bulk for the bulk of the game. I think Ireland might have been dropping off a bit in the end of that game because they'd won it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the question. I think their game plan is sound if they can get front foot ball. But okay. is their game plan set up to get front foot ball well yeah. enough? Okay. Right, uh, Tinker, 1960. Uh, who or what is to blame uh, for England's demise? One, post-line tiredness. Two, other teams getting better while England stood still. Three, Eddie Jones for lack of looking to the future and developing younger players. Or four, Eddie Jones for playing players out of position. Oh, thanks, Tinker. That's, that's like three, four in one there. Okay, yeah. reason one. Um, Post-line tiredness, I think, is a reason but not an excuse. There's yeah. a difference there. There's never an excuse in international rugby. Yeah. Um, two, other teams getting better. Yes, definitely. 
England's tactics haven't advanced and or adapted as well as others, for sure. Um, three, what was his three? Um, Eddie Jones not looking to the future. Ah, not particularly. You could argue it. I think Underhill would have actually played most of those matches, but a real problem that he was injured. I think that was a real blow. Yeah. And four, playing players out of position. Yeah, I think so. Mm. In the back row, I think we saw that. Um, like in the last game playing, I think Robshaw and Haskell was a, a bad move. Armand should have got in there. Yeah. One of the, in a, in a, in, you know, Natural seven should have been in there if there is one. So, yeah, yeah. I think there's a fair point on four. All right. Uh, okay, Thomas Alderton, uh, what is, could be, England's best 10, 12, 13 combination? I personally would like to see Farrell to Alangi Slade. Okay. Evidence, that's what I'm saying. There's not a lot of evidence for anything apart from Ford Farrell and JJ or Ford Farrell and someone like JJ being the best. Yeah. Okay, like I wanted to see Farrell TO JJ. Yeah. We saw it, no evidence to say it was better. Yeah. So yeah. at the moment, it's kind of guessing. Yeah. So if I was to play a best midfield right now, it would have to be Ford Farrell and JJ. If that's good enough, well, that's another question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right, the Harris Channel. Uh, I've heard a lot of complaints about refereeing being biased against England. Did you notice this at all, especially in the Scotland and Ireland games? Okay, I don't think refs are biased. They definitely don't mean to be biased. And what I think is happening is they're interpreting things slightly differently. Like, how long is a player allowed to hold on to the ball? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think they're allowing refs to have personal interpretations a bit too much maybe yeah um, and they just need to kind of solidify what is allowed how long is holding on um, what can you do on the floor what can you do in the ruck and just kind of unify their interpretation a bit better then it would look less biased yeah I mean I, I made that point when when England played Scotland that it did look a little bit in favour of the Scottish when when Nigel Owens was refereeing that game again mm -hmm. it's open to interpretation Time is time is a big issue. If you yep. if you get that call within two seconds, then so be it. But Players if the other team gets know. it, they just want to know consistency. Yeah. They just want to know what's allowed. Yeah, exactly. Um, right then, where were you? This one. Right, it's Henry. Yes. Uh, would it be worth bringing in Ben Ryan as a tack coach? Um, would he be an option for England? Certainly interesting. I think certainly think they could do with an attacking coach coming in. Um, yeah. Ryan is a bit of a genius. But again, evidence isn't really there. He's done great stuff in the sevens. He's been doing some consulting, but it will be a risk. Yeah. I'm not saying he wouldn't be good in the future, but I, I would say no, it's a bit okay. too much of a risk. Uh, right, Conor Murphy. With England's attack looking rudder rudderless at the moment, and with Daly looking superb, do you think Eddie Jones will try him at 13 at any point before the World Cup? Yes. Cool. Uh, super cool gaming. Uh, should Scotland look to develop an away tactic? E.g. be more boring and composed for 60 minutes and then maybe look to open up the game for the last 20. The main thing I pulled away from this championship is that Scotland can't play away from home. Should they have an away tactic? Um, I think all teams should be open to changing the way they play to spend, depending on the situation. So yes, I think they should, but I don't think they will. No. Okay. Uh, Oliver Taylor, uh, what's England's best team or best back row? Go on then, let's go for it. At the moment, on evidence, I would say if they were to put out their best team for a World Cup game, it would be uh, Mako, Hartley, Sinclair, uh, Matoje, Launchbury, Rob Short, Underhill, Billy in the pack, Youngson, Ford, um, Daly, one wing, Watson, the other wing, Farrell, JJ, midfield, Brown, fullback. Okay. I'd, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? I'd, yeah, I'd sim. They're the same, I think. On evidence. Yeah. I'm not I think, saying yeah, it's good yeah. enough, I'm just saying that's why I think their best is. Yeah, the only thing I, the only person I might have a question mark over is Sinclair, because mm -hmm. I think his impact off the bench yep. is, it makes a real difference, whereas Dan Cole, I think, is better starting for me. Yeah. But, yeah. Right, 25, Pritchard, 25. For England's tour in South Africa, what's uh, your thoughts on a Farrell 10, Slade 12, and Tuolangi 13? If fit and at a 2012 form, if he could ever get back to that. Uh, I don't think we're going to see it. I think Farrell's going to be rested. I don't know if Tulangi's going to be fit. It's interesting, but I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, Gavin McGuinness, uh, with Joe's current record with Ireland and potential first semi final for the team, do you think the IRFU will be able to retain him after his contract runs out, or do you see him being poached by New Zealand? Uh, probably not. If he wants to be in the running for the All Blacks job, he probably needs to get into the New Zealand domestic scene. 
probably an assistant coach role after that. So I think that's very attractive. I think he'd be a great All Blacks coach. Yeah, he would. And I think, you know, he's done great stuff for Ireland, um, but I, I think he will probably move on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Cool. So, Alan B, uh, is the salary cap good or bad for the game? Should the Premiership be ring fenced so no regulation, and they could use an NFL style draft to keep the teams fair? Okay, no relegation. Ah, right, okay. So, at the moment, I think the salary cap is probably the best way to protect the clubs at the moment, protect them from themselves. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, people overspend, they get in too much debt, they probably are already in the Premiership. Yeah. So, I think it's a ne necessary thing. And I probably think no relegation is actually the right way to go at the moment. You know, championship clubs, you know, we've seen them implode. We've seen London Welsh implode. Yeah. We don't want that to no. happen. And I just don't think there's enough money there to run a fully professional championship. I yeah. might suggest it goes fully semi-pro and kind of have a ring-fenced premiership for now. Yeah. As painful as that would be. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing I would add to that is I think... It, with the RFU being one of the most heavily financially driven organisations in the world for rugby, I'd have them centrally contract their international players and I would have them go to a regional programme, a bit like they do down under, and a mm -hmm. bit like they've started to do in Ireland and in Wales. I think that is the way through. Make it a bit more financially stable, like you said. I mean, we do have some questions on, on uh, central contracting, yeah. so I'll finish on that. Um, what I think the way to go is, I've heard that actually the, the contract with the Premiership mm. is not up to like 2024, something right. like that, so they couldn't do anything until then anyway, Yeah. Um, if they did want to go full central mm. contracts for the England players. But I do think there's some merit on the idea I said in the last video of this kind of small dual contract mm. idea, where they give Premiership clubs some cash yeah. and say, for this cash, we want a, a bit more control of our players, i.e. to be able to rest a, a couple of weeks of the year. Yeah, yeah just to give them that little less game time for their clubs but compensate the clubs yep. and allow them to be fresher for internationals. I can yeah. see that definitely being an option. Yeah, because I think you look at the way that England have been as well, this, this Six Nations, they look tired and there's, they've played a lot of games, lot especially of games, when they go yeah. back to their clubs and they're yeah. in straight but away. It's players not... always want to play. Uh, yeah. play. You ask a player, are you happy playing at 95% fitness? Of course they are. Yeah. They want to play. So what you have to do is create structures to protect them from themselves. Mm. You know, a player like Mara Toje is so unbelievably fit, he could play every game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know as a, as a coach, sports science, whatever, he'll probably drop off one or two percent, mm. which he may not feel, but you can measure and see. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you have to put structures in to protect him from himself and get yeah. the best out of him for his career. Yeah. Okay, guys, Al, thank you so much for reading all those That's questions. Right, no worries. Absolutely stacks of stuff there. Really interesting questions. Yeah. Keep them coming. Keep the comments coming. Uh, we'll be back during some summer tours, doing some videos on that. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for all your support, your views, your comments. And until then, enjoy your rugby, guys.